Hey everyone, uh, my name is Juan Suarez Ugarte, uh, I work at the SSL Predator. Uh, today we're going to give you a little introduction about microencapsulation. That is one of the technologies that this company has created. And I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to explain about the principles for this microencapsulation, how important is this for the oil industry. So I'm going to talk, uh, talk about a little bit about me. So I am a uh, my bachelor in chemical engineering, I had a PhD in chemistry. I have been working the last 10 years in uh, research development with basic chemistry with potential industrial applications. In the last two years of my uh, experience, I have been trying to search for uh, and optimize for new technologies. Technologies uh, for delivery, chemicals for downhole applications. In that particular sense, Odessa Separator has created a patent microencapsulation technology. So now let's understand a little bit of what is microencapsulation. So my, microencapsulation, by definition, is the addition of the coating to a liquid, a gas, or a solid. So why you wanna create a coating? Well, the first reason for that is you wanna protect your chemical from the external environment, such as oxidation, light degradation, and from humidity. So, but the second most important reason why we, we are applying this concept of microencapsulation is because we want to control the dispersion of the chemical inside. That's the main reason we want to control. And I'm going to give you just an example. So, think about it like in pharmaceutical industry. So, sometimes uh, having higher amounts of chemical doesn't mean that it's going to make you good. That's not the answer. Sometimes you just need a small concentrations in order for a chemical to work. And the best example I can give you is the vaccination. You, you receive a small concentration of, 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 the, of the virus in order to develop some antibodies. So you don't need the whole you know, concentration of the virus because it's going to kill you. So the same concept applies to the, to the oil industry. Sometimes having high excess of the, of the chemical is going to fix one problem, but it's going to create another one. So for that reason, uh, I'm going to discuss about this microencapsulation. So Odessa Separator has been able to transform traditional liquid uh, chemical inhibitors into a solid state, into a solid state that you see here, right? But now that we have overcome this issue or this, uh, this uh, technology, then we need a second uh, technology that will allow us to deliver this chemical for downhole, and uh, the separator has created these chem screens. The chem screens will allow us to insert the chemical inside. So then, this combination will allow us to bring chemical treatment for downhole applications. And this combination is very flexible. Why? This is very flexible because this is compatible with any artificial. And here we're gonna show you just two examples. For example, for the rock pond, you can install the chem screen below the sitting nipple. But in this case, you need an intake. In the case of an ESP, you can put it below the packer because you already have an intake point. So at the end, what we are showing here is that we can provide chemical for downhole. So now the question is, how do we trigger this chemical? Well, the chemical is gonna be triggered when it's in contact with the fluid that is coming from your production. See these areas? Those are the open areas that we have for the fluid to be in contact with the with the chemical. So in that way, the chemical is going to start leaching gradually and providing, you know, protection from the bottom to the top. And see the design for this uh, uh, screen. This screen has the big wire technology, the same technology that we use to separate or uh, for our sun separator. This is going to guarantee the linear dispersion of the chemical. So you don't have to be worried of the big chunks of the chemical coming out or, or into your system. That's not going to happen. We are controlling that. So now the question that you may be asking is, how do you do this microencapsulation? I mean, is it a simple process? The answer is not. It's not a simple process. You need to apply some very quality control 
in order to get the right uh, polymeric reaction. And we're going to see in the next slide how this microencapsulation works, how we do it in a big scale. So normally this microencapsulation will be divided four steps. The first step we had the chemical inhibitor in the lipid phase, right? Then we had the first step which is the absorption of premix. And we use an inert matrix. The second step is the most important because we're, get, we're gonna generate a chemical reaction. That chemical reaction is gonna produce a polymer. The polymer need to be to to grow in three different sections, like in, three, in the three D network. So, the higher the interaction of the chemical, is the higher the capacity you're gonna have to encapsulate your your chemical, and that property is related to the cross linking that we're gonna explain in the next slide. Um, so the final step of this process is the the curing time. So you're gonna see that after a specific period of time. This uh, microencapsulation, the external surface of the, of the chemical is going to develop a, a thick layer. That thick layer is going to protect the chemical, the integrity of the chemical inside. From, like I mentioned before, from oxidation, from degradation, light degradation, and of course from humid. And that's, that's going to stay. That means you can store these chemicals for a specific period of time without any problem. So, <clears throat> The final step that we call matrix encapsulation. So why do we call matrix encapsulation? The reason for this concept is because the polymer has been homogeneously distributed with the chemical inside. And we're gonna see a little video so you can see with your eyes what I'm talking about. Was, I guess our video is not working at this moment, so <laughs> I apologize for that. But the reason uh, that I was talking about the matrix encapsulation is this the polymer is going to distribute homogeneously with the chemical inside. So it's going to create homogeneous spot for the chemical. That means you take a fraction of this, a fraction of this, then it's going to create it. You're going to have your chemical and your, and your polymer in the same fraction. So, like I mentioned before, the cross-linking, which is the intermolecular interaction that's going to happen with the polymer, is crucial because this property is going to determine the physical and chemical properties associated with, for example, the solubility of the polymer. How soluble? That means we can change this process and modify the solubility properties of the, of, of the polymer. So in this case, like I said, this before, this is in the process of the cross-linking, you can see how the mass has changed because of the cross-linking increasing and the propagation of the polymer. So now we have a mass that can be molded easily and can be extruded. Like I mentioned before, we can extrude it to the, to the shape that we want, but in this case, we're using cylindrical form. So another important fact that I have to mention about this process is before curing, the hardness is, is you know slow because after a specific period of time, the uh, the microencapsulation is going to de develop a thick layer, and you can compare that. The hardness has increased from 60 to 80 for its uniform, and that's what you want that thick protection at the moment of creating these these materials. Now let's understand a little bit more of this chemistry. So, so now that we have these uh, chemicals in calculation now, how do we deliver this downfall? So we need a delivery system. And like I mentioned before, Odessa Separate has created these chemistry. These chemistry are gonna facilitate for us to bring the chemicals downfall. And you can see in the screen, we have different combinations that we have achieved for the chemicals. We have we can treat your scale issues, we can treat your corrosion problems, we can 
also has chemicals specifically for high concentration of H2S. We have paraffin and asphaltin inhibitors as well. The formers, and this combination can be always uh, modified based on the customer. We always can modify this because we have control over the, pro the process of making this uh, microencapsulation. So the longevity of the food will depend on the production uh, conditions, of course. But we can make it, we can go from 24 to 144 food of chemical treatment, especially for higher production. Also, we can change the uh, we can change the uh, the opening size for, for the chemical. For example, in this one, we had a big opening size, and normally you will do that for a shock treatment. You want to change the pH condition, then you use this, and then you you combine this with a, a, a slow release, for example. The other important fact that I want to mention: the other advantage of having these chemicals in a solid state is you can combine. You can combine your treatment with scale, corrosion, and paraffin, for example, if you want it. Or you can just run the pure scale, corrosion, and then, you know, complement the treatment from the truth phase. With corrosion or whatever is needed. So this technology has been created in order to complement your chemical treatment. So we're going to reach where other chemical treatments, they can reach or they can or the optimization or, or the, the way they reach is not pure, I mean, it's not uh, optimal. So let's go see the next slide. Um, so now that we understand that we are able to bring chemical uh, solutions for example, applications, then how do we trace those chemicals? How do we know the chemicals working? How do we know that it's a change? Well, first of all, we use uh, residuals. That's Traditionally, what the surface treatment use residuals. Normally, you will see uh, residuals for amines, amines which is are for corrosion inhibitors. For in the, in the case of the scan inhibitors, you will run residuals for phosphate. And by residual, we mean the concentration of chemical that has been dissolved in the production system. That's what it means for by residuals. So, additionally to that, uh, the separate tool has added other. Uh, other ways to trace our, our chemicals. One is the THPS. We can also trace iron and manganese. The iron and manganese level will tell you about the corrosion activity in your system. So it's gonna help you to decide, right, at the moment. Um, I'm gonna go explain a little bit about THPS in the next slide, so I'm gonna jump to the polytag. The polytag is, is a unique way that other separator can trace uh, all chemicals. So the main difference that having the polytag is that that's going to be distinguished from the surface treatment, for example, because every 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 product that we have microencapsulated is coming from the uh, from this free polymer has been added to every single product that we have. That means we can trace any product in the system, and we can differentiate from the surface treatment. So the major, major advantage of this treatment, uh, this uh, tracer of polymer, is that it uses immunosay technology. Immunosay technology basically allows you to, de to determine minimum concentrations of, of the chemical. And for this case, they have added like a antibody target to the polymer has been added. And that antibody can be detected easily. The other important advantage of having this method is this it's not a color, colorimetric method. That means you can detect the, the polymer in any water condition. So that, that, that won't be a problem. So normally the test is being done with small concentrations of water, and then we can determine by a color development. You can see the, the line on the top, that will tell you if you have a free polymer or not. If you don't detect the polymer, that means the, the chemical that we have is, uh, uh, <coughs> is uh, at the end of the, of the lifetime of the chemical. And also we can change this, uh, we can uh, quantify this uh, methodology. This methodology can be quantified by using a specific instrumentation that we have, and we can convert, you know, the, the uh, 
this qualitative test to a quantitative test. So we can get the PPMs of free polymer that has been dissolved at the moment or for the analysis. So we can determine indirectly the concentration of the chemicals in the in the in the tool. So normally uh, we have to our customers that in order to give you a good recommendation, we need like specific information from you. Normally we, we will ask you for uh, complete water analysis or we can do it here in the lab. So we want to detect the potential scale of corrosion issues that you have in your well. Sometimes we will do some oil analysis to determine the concentration of paraffin or asphaltines, if that's the case. Sometimes you have been having some failure with solids that associate with sand. Then we, we do some sand analysis, sand sip analysis. And normally in here, in this analysis, we, we can detect you have scale and corrosion problems because the sand most of the time is associated, is associated with this with, with these problems. Um, again, there are some companies that may be afraid to use our chemicals, then we can do some compatibility studies. So just to show you that the chemical is compatible with it. In some occasions, we can do an analysis to determine the corrosion rate in the wellhead of your systems. And in general, we do analysis, uh, solid analysis to determine the type of scale that's causing the problem in your system. So until this point, I guess we had shown you that how the microcapsulation technology is it's a very important tool. It's a very innovative tool that, that we are uh, offering. So we can microcapsulate chemicals, different type of chemical treatments, and we can reach with all, all this kind of reach. Okay, and we can trace our chemicals so we can give you uh, feedback information of what is happening with your, your system. So you are not alone. So now let's let's understand a little bit what are the common problems you are very familiar with this, what are the common problems that you are gonna deal in the oil production. Normally you're gonna have problems with scale issues, corrosion iron sulfide problems, and um, paraffin asphalt things. In the case of the scale, as you know, the, the major percentage of problem is due to calcite or calcium carbon. That's the, the, what the one that's major percentage. The good thing is this can be treated easily with a scale inhibitor. But in some cases, when the conditions are too high, then you would use you know, an acid charge problem. In the case of the gypsum, which is the calcium sulfide, then that's a difference, it's not as a soluble. In this case, you need to transform this gypsum to a something, to a soluble salt that you can treat it. So maybe you will use sodium hydroxide or any other base to change the, the solubility properties of this one. So still you can deal with that. In the case of the cedar, that obviously that's the calcium carbonate. Uh, that's due to the presence of carbon dioxide. That also can be treated without any problem. In the case of the parid and celestine, which is barium sulfide and strontium sulfide, then that's a big problem. There is no chemical treatment for this. If this is scale forming your system, then the only way to remove it is mechanically. Or well, there have been some studies uh, recently that they use some, some special metal chelators to provide chemical treatment, but that is still under investigation. So I guess one well, of the major issues that I have to observe in the values when I'm doing the analysis is the iron sulfide. And obviously the iron sulfide is caused because of the presence of uh, hydrogen sulfide. Remember the hydrogen sulfide is, the, is not uh, for bacteria. It's the SRB bacteria. So that's very common. But I think one of the major issues that I have seen is with uh, H2S products. See in the field that hydrogen sulfide initially get absorbed into the metal system and then start, you know, creating the iron sulfide. But something that uh, that you need to realize also is that the product of the formation of the iron sulfide is the hydrogen. The same with the iron carbon, the hydrogen. The hydrogen is another another problem because the hydrogen will reduce the the, the strain on your system. 
So this gas is is able to penetrate the porosity of your of your of your tubing system, and it can create cracking. So just think about that. Have that in mind at the moment thinking about hydrogen sulfide issue. So another big issue is the paraffin, of course, and asphalt. Mostly, I have seen paraffin problems, and normally these paraffin problems they they get worse when they are associated with sand, with sand or the scale. So now that we have a little bit of understanding what are the big issues that you're dealing in the oil industry, let me show you what solution do we have. To offer. So in the case of scale issues, uh, we have different uh, cocktail of ingredients, cocktail the chemicals. We have the scale inhibitors that will act efficiently for calcium carbonate. Also, we, we, we will have also uh, the addition of some metal plate. So what is the big difference between scale inhibitors and metal chelate? Normally, the, the scale inhibitors will act for a particular cation of positive species. But sometimes you need another help, like a metal chelate, to increase the efficiency of the, of the scale inhibitors. So that's why at the desert we have different combinations. And normally, we, we will decide what is the best uh, optimum product that you need, or what the combination that, that you need in order to succeed with your products. Normally, the way that this scanning system works is basically, let's see here, you have, for example, calcium carbonate. So the way that scanning inhibitors work is basically they bind to the cations or, or to the metals, the species. So you prevent from this, from this chemical to get into the solid state. That's basically how it works. The same with the metal chelator. The main difference with the metal chelator, we, we can have metal chelator with different affinities. So let's say, for example, in here in the figure, this is a monodentate, a bidentate, and tridentate. That means you can coordinate to the metals in, the, in three different ways. So the higher the, the bonds to the, to, the, to the metal, the higher the, the interaction. <laughs> And the higher the efficiency of the metal chelator is going to be. Normally, for higher uh, scale conditions, we, we recommend the acid surfactant. The, the acid surfactant is the analogous to, to your acid jam, which will be the hydrochloric acid. The main difference that stay in that is the acid surfactant is not going to cause higher damage uh, to your pipe system, but hydrochloric acid, it will do. It's very corrosive, it's very strong. But that would be the, the alternative for your acid jam as surfactant. Also, in the case of the strontium and barium sulfates, like I mentioned before, when this is skeleton form, then there is no way to treat the chemical. So you need to prevent those things. And the best way to do it is you know, to reduce the number of cations in the, in the solution. And for that, we have a special combination with acrylic homopolymers. Those homopolymers, they're gonna step into the pipe and they're gonna prevent further crystallization. So we have different options and to offer a death separator. And like I said before, the more information that you can provide us, the more that we can help you. In the case of corrosion inhibitors, uh, our cocktail or chemicals are based on amines, polyamines, quaternary amines, Immediately, surfactants, copper quark, and we are working uh, right now in trying to get some housing in study. Remember, one of the major um, of the major factors to increase the corrosion downfall would be the presence of oxygen as well. So I'm working right now trying to microencapsulate some housing in scavengers to provide better performance for this corrosion inhibitors. In here, this is an example of some recent experiments that we have done. So see from left to right. From left to right, we have you know a coupon, a flat coupon, and we have created a corrosive environment to produce H2S. So see that this is the number one and the number four. Okay, we have added corrosion inhibitors from other separate. Those are other corrosion inhibitors from other from other companies, and this one doesn't have any corrosion inhibitor as well, uh, at all. So you can see after one day. The whole uh, coupon has been covered with uh, iron sulfide. 
because it doesn't have any corrosion inhibitor. That's what will happen with your pipes. See the examples with the Odessa separate chemicals. See the the formation of iron sulfide has been basically reduced almost 90, 80 percent. See other uh, chemical inhibitors, they don't do the same effect. Something that you have to have in mind is when we talk about corrosion inhibitors, there's two types, man. They are the ones, the chemicals that they are going to create a film in protection in your system. And they are all that they are going to change the pH in your system, but they are not going to produce a film. So those make difference. So although they separate, we try to combine those options. So we have a better, you know, efficiency of corrosion inhibitor. So now let's go in the next slide. So the acid jack option for iron sulfide. So I have seen a, a lot of problems with iron sulfide, especially coming out from the pipe that you know plug in your pumps or systems. Um, normally, the, like I mentioned before, the first option would be hydrochloric acid and acid jack. Like I say, the the hydrochloric acid is very corrosive. If you do this for a prolonged period of time, then you're gonna cause another problem to your system. So here's uh, some experiments that we perform in the lab, and you can see the first row correspond. Uh, we generate, you know, H2S in situ, and as you expected, you are creating iron sulfide in your in your coupons. Then. We added some concentration of hydrochloric acid, normally 20% that they use. And you can see that immediately, obviously, it's changing, right? It's removing the iron supply, so it's working. But it's prolonged period of time, you do that, it's gonna cause corrosion to your system, but you're creating another problem. So what options do we have to offer to replace the acid jar instead of hydrochloric acid? So the first option that we have, and you can see here, after eight minutes, you get the same results, but it's not hydrochloric acid. That's our acid surfactant. The main advantage of using the acid surfactant is that it's not gonna produce harm to your system compared to the hydrochloric acid. And the other thing is because of the surfactant activity, it's gonna create some uh, coating that is gonna act as a corrosive inhibitor for this particular system. See. That in this separator, we also have two other options, which are the phosphonate, phosphonium salts. Probably you will hear about this uh, PHPS. See that after adding the the the, uh, the THPS, it didn't produce any change at all. But after a specific period of time, most of the like that one to three hours, you see that this system is working the same as these two. So the main difference between these two systems comparing to those two is we are not creating H2S as a subproduct. In this case, when you are dissolving the iron sulfide, you are creating H2S. So you need a, a secondary treatment to neutralize the H2S. In this case, not. So this is a more friendly way to create your wealth. THPS and another derivative of THPS. So that's the option that we have as the separate. And again, we work based on the customer needs, and we have proof, you know, to show you the better options for you for your treatments. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is another example that we came up uh, a few months ago. Um, so normally, when we talk about methods, iron sulfide, we, we forgot about that. It can be other methods that can form sulfides as well. One of them has been zinc sulfide. The main difference between zinc sulfide and iron sulfide is zinc sulfide is considered like exotic. Why? Because it's not very common. But we have seen some wells that having those issues. And this is just an example of uh, uh, a brine, you know, a well with the same fluid conditions. We generate H2S and we notice that immediately forms the, the zinc sulfide. So this, this well was with high concentration of zinc. Zinc salt. So these salts, these zinc salts reacting immediately with the H two S in solution, and see it immediately turns black. However, in those systems, we have some chemical combinations from the separator, and you see there's there's a big difference. 
after one day you can see the formation of the single file but you can see the combination that we provided in the separate we had different combination and we were able to suppress that formation so this is something just to keep in mind we can make different combinations and you can see the effectivity at the beginning for example this combination it didn't work but as the specific period of time start working because of the reaction process right so this is the type of experiment that we like to do with your fluids we want to get accuracy with the type of problem that you have um, let me show you another example with the paraffin asphalt team. this is a, a paraffin a microscopic view so you can you know that the paraffin is stuck in your pattern and you, you can add a fluid with the fluid especially when low temperatures the same with the, with the asphalt team. so all paraffin and asphalt inhibitors that we have in, in houses are based in was uh, crystal modifiers uh, four point depressants and dispersed that combination helps you know as you can see microscopically how the the physical uh, properties of the of the paraffin is being changed you can see it. now you had some some paraffin that can be easily dispersed from your fluid and like i say sometimes one combination doesn't work you have to use you know different options for your system Okay, now let's see the next slide. Um, so, like I mentioned before, those, those, uh, the use of these chemistry screens is not. We have several case studies that I'm gonna pass over. Luis Wanakas, our engineer, that's gonna give you uh, a little more detail about the case studies that we have show success for these chemistry screens. Luis. Okay. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, well, after this very well introduction that Renzo made us, we're going to go uh, and check some case study. I'd really like to talk about these case studies because this is actually what, uh, what we normally face. We could go with the customer and we present a new technology, you know, something that uh, is new for you and innovation. And then, of course, the operator company has many questions. Uh, they are concerned about how this tool is going to work, if it's really what I need for my field, if it's really the solution I'm looking for uh, to solve my problems. So to solve all these questions, we try to apply all the engineering process, we try to solve all the questions, but still, you know, it is really difficult. It is really difficult. Like in the normal life, uh, academic, personal life, when you're going to try something new, it's really difficult to move from the traditional to the new. So this is a kit with a local company in the Permian Basin. They were really interested in our technology. They were really trying to solve the problems because it was so difficult to optimize uh, the fields they were they were producing from uh, in the chemical side. So we proposed them to do a pilot test, you know. Uh, do a pilot, run our chemical in different wells with different conditions, different problems, and then see how the performance of our chemical will help or not the performance of the wells. So if you can see in the summary table, we did this pilot test in three stages. Stage number one, number two, and number three for a total amount of well of 27 wells. So we installed our chemical treatment in 27 wells. Uh, the wells, like I said before, have different conditions. They have different production, different production completions. What I mean, they have different pump. If you see on the graphic, uh, you will realize that 60% of the wells completed in this uh, project were using ESPs. 33% were using rod pumps, and then 7% of the well were producing through gasoline. The target right now, or the target for this project, was very specific. Uh, they, we were aiming to increase the average runtime of this field, of the fields, which were around 200 days, and then evaluate some KPIs 
and we are taking a look in the next slide for uh, trying to identify if it's really uh, if it's really our chemical tools were doing its job. So the longevity expected for this for each well was 365 well days, sorry, except for the first two wells. Because they were the first two wells, like you see in the stage one, uh, they were expecting a longer uh, longevity for two reasons. First reason, because this is a new technology. So when you try technology, you normally use uh, the worst wells, I mean the wells with the most difficult problems, combination of different problems. So these two wells have new speed completion and they were having sand and chemical problems because corrosion and scale. So for these two wells, the longevity expected was 548 days and the target for everything in the project was to overcome the average runtime of this well. Can we move to the next slide, please, Rachel? So these were the KPIs we were analyzing for this project. In this project, we tried to analyze the factors that will let us know if our chemical were actually working in each well. So we choose corrosion rate, iodine and manganese, the scale and corrosion inhibitor, and the DHPS and polytar. For the major part of the wells, we were having corrosion and scale issues. Scale issues due to calcium carbonate, and then they have also iron sulfide. So that's why you see the DHPS right there. The DHPS is not a normal component we track. I mean, we track normally the polytar, which, uh, like Rens was playing before, it's an indicator, it's our blueprint. That's going to be our identification in cases where the operator company is using surface and downfall chemical trade. We will talk about this shortly. So for the corrosion rate, each field has the threshold or has the expectation. So for the operator company, the expectation was to keep the corrosion rate below one MPY, right? So what we use is we use coupons along the period uh, when we have the chemical installed and we were taking those, uh, those, well, actually the operator company was the one taking those coupons and doing the corrosion rate by a third company. Uh, and it's, of course, uh, a good a good measure, you know? If you are proving something new, you want to know by yourself is it working and know that the own company who is doing all the design, chemical analysis, diagnosis, and then installation is the one who's going to tell you if it's working or not, obviously. So the operator company was the one uh, measuring the corrosion rate, and then the iron and manganese components are very important. Like Renz was playing before, it is an indicator of corrosion of corrosion activity. So iron and manganese are components which are naturally inside the water, but we cannot actually increase or reduce, increase the iron and manganese content by natural sources. What I mean is there's, there should be something outside the reservoir water who is increasing my iron and manganese. And this factor is the steel. We use all the pipe steels in our completion downfall, and that's gonna be my sources of iron and manganese. So if my manganese is increasing, that means I'm having corrosion issues. If my iron is increasing, I'm having corrosion issues as well. But what happens when my manganese is increasing, but I'm having a decreasing on my iron concentration? That's where we can say that this is going to be the factor when I'm seeing maybe an iron sulfide, right? Because if my manganese is increasing, and the only way how my manganese is increasing is because the steel being corrosive or being corrupted by the water, my iron should increase, right? But if my level actually are decreasing or are keeping low, it means the iron is going somewhere. 
one of the places where the iron is going could be an inorganic reaction with sulfides with carbonates. So I could be having on my wells calcium carbonate or iron sulfide. So that's why, in this way, we're going to talk about the DHPS. That's why for this specific operator and for this specific project, we were using DHPS measures. Because the DHPS, like Renzo was playing before, it's my iron chelator. It's the component who is going to help me to cache those iron cations and it's going to avoid the reaction with either sulfides or either carbonates, iron in my water. So I'm preventing with the DHPS, I'm preventing that in case I'm having biodegradation or I'm having some corrosion issues, my iron is not going to move and then affect uh, with inorganic deposit. I hope that can be clear. If you got any questions, you can actually uh, ask in our webinar in YouTube and then we will try to explain or give some highlights about everything we are talking about. Okay, so iron and manganese are pretty good indicators for the activity or for the action either of our scale and corrosion inhibitors. But uh, we need to still make sure that the amount of inhibitor we are providing along the period we are treating the well, it is actually the, uh, the, the one that is effective the effective concentration. That's why we are still, or we are measuring also a scale and corrosion inhibitor. If you see at the bottom of the graphic, you will see two lines, straight lines, orange and blue. The orange one is the threshold of the corrosion inhibitor. And the one at the top, the blue line is the threshold of the scale inhibitor. Above these two lines, we will, say, we will say the amount of chemical we are dispersing is enough. It's the recommended one, and is the necessary to treat the well and then avoid scaling corrosion issue. But how we determine this threshold? There are two ways. We can actually do lab tests. We can receive your fluid sample. We can test our chemical components, and we can say your minimal concentration is X and Y. Okay. The second way is based on our own, we got some calibration curves. And those calibration curves means the minimal value where we have found our chemical effective. So the operator company has these two options. Do their own test, evaluate the condition uh, of their own production water, and then tell us like, hey, I found these results, we can discuss, you know, this is something about teamwork, you know, cooperation. We are not going to be success if we don't have the feedback or uh, if we don't have the cooperation from the uh, operator company. That's why it's so important to work as a team. So we receive the information, we analyze the information, and we can come out with, uh, with some analysis about that and then tell about how it's going to work better, okay? Uh, the other the other factor or the other KPI we are analyzing is the point type. The point type, like Rains was playing for, is our blueprint, is our uh, our identity downhole. It's how we can tell the customer, hey, we are in this way in, uh, in the well. We have still remaining chemical, we are good. And then if you see at the bottom, you can see another straight line. That is straight line for the polytype, the orange one, is going to indicate the threshold, the minimum threshold. We set a minimum threshold on 15 ppm, but it is going to depend based on the uh, production of the well, uh, the water cut, the bottom hole temperature, which is a very, very challenging in this kind of application. So uh, analyzing this value, we can determine, OK, you are good. you are in an optimal concentration, or we can tell, no, you know, we have realized our chemical has gone for any reason and we can start combining treatment. I mean, we are very honest with the customer. We know that there are many factors or many parameters, phenomena, uh, going downfall, working together, and then it is really difficult to try to simulate all these factors. 
you know, there are conditions very challenging that uh, they need a little more details on the design and they need more uh, analysis to come up with a, an effective solution. So that's why we try to do this test. We try to analyze the KPIs that the operator and ourselves determine as uh, the key KPIs and then how we can still prove that our chemical it is actually the solution of your problems. Uh, can you go to the next one, please, Renzo? Okay, this graphic is uh, actually the summary of the wells who were declared as approved, successful well, you know? If you see the graphic, after analyze all the factors, after analyze uh, the runtime, and then together with the KPIs, corrosion rate, manganese and iron, a scale and corrosion inhibitor, THPS concentration and polytap concentration in your residual water, we can come out and say the conclusion is this well was approved, successful case, or on the other hand, it was down, and then we can declare like a lesson learned, we can analyze uh, the failure cases, and, and like we always, when we have a fail, we do our pulling report, we analyze the factor, and we come out with the conclusion. This graphic specifically is summarizing the result from the proof work. Red line in the middle is identifying the runtime, the average runtime of the field, which is around 200 days. So the fields that the operator was operating, they were having a lot of sand and chemical issues. And that was a challenge, of course. Uh, so the deal was increase the runtime again and then keep the KPIs above the threshold that we defined initially. So as you see, all the wells that were approved, they had a runtime on average more than 300 and more than a year, more than 365 days. The first two wells, well 1.1 and the well 1.2, they had an outstanding performance beyond the threshold, beyond the longevity expected. And that's why the pilot continued, you know, analyzing how well the first two wells performed. It was the main reason because uh, the operator decided to continue with the 27 wells. At this point, we're having a successful rate of 75%. So from the 27 wells, we have analyzed uh, 16 wells and we have declared declared successful uh, 12 wells. There's four wells uh, we analyzed, we determined the causes, we determined why there was difficulties with, the well, with these wells, either because the downhole conditions, could be because the artificial lip system, could be because uh, maybe in some cases, and this is very particular and very, uh, very frequently in the Permian, when you frack a well in the neighbor well, you can see the fracture maybe are creating communication between two wells. We call that a frack heat, and then that heat remove a higher production. So we design our treatment for its production, and at the end of the period, we have a different highest production. So we analyze those variables. Okay, next one, please, Renzo. And this is the graphic of the wells that are still being in progress. Uh, we have still in progress 11 wells. From Out of that 11 wells, three wells have been declared successful because they have overcome uh, the threshold, which is 80% of the longevity expected. So the wells 3.6, 3.5, and 3.4 are successful right now. The other eight wells are still running. We are still uh, taking samples, and then we are still measuring the KPIs and then surveillancing how is the performance for all these wells. Uh, depends on the severity of the problem, the frequency of the residual samples could be month by month, every two weeks, and in severe cases, where we see maybe stream increase in the KPIs, we can take samples every week. We can come up with the operator and the results and the 
get together to analyze the possible solution. Uh, next one, please, Renzo. Okay, so in the conclusion, we can say that uh, the creation of the microencapsulated chemical matrix, all the process that Renzo was playing, all the engineering and the methods behind that process, it is actually an optimal solution that uh, is proven to be applied in wells where you're having difficulties with the production fluid. Of course, you need to follow the protocols, you need to make sure to accomplish the design criteria, and then you need to make sure to consider all the variables in this design. Uh, well, this is a new technology, so this is a new chemical treatment using downhole. We have proof, not only in this pilot project, we are explaining you this pilot project because it's very representative. And like I said at the, at the beginning of the presentation, it is actually what we face or what everyone face when it's introducing a new technology, something new for the operators. But uh, we try to make it possible and effective, even under the most typical conditions. But we recognize there are still different variables that we need to evaluate develop and then for example we are right now trying to set up a new bank of bank of tests for ultra high temperature condition and then oil which are very challenging condition that we have been able to run in but we want to improve those performance uh, talking about the case study despite the low run time that the fields were facing because different problems including chemical problems we were actually able to overcome that threshold. We were able to overcome that expectation. And for the next stage that we are doing right now, or we are monitoring right now with the stage number three, we are waiting to achieve more than 75 of successful rate. Aiming to repeat a value of both this one, and then that's how we are working right now. Uh, well, this solution finally is uh, profitable and be applied in different ALS. Of course, ALS have to be different considerations, like the method of installation. For example, in ESP, we can go right below the sensor or right below the assembly you are installing below the sensor. Uh, in rod bond, in gas leak, you need to make sure to install a uh, intake, slurry soup, perforated joint, anything to work as an intake because the chemical is not going to flow through the chemical screen. I mean, the fluid is not going to flow through the chemical screen. Uh, the fluid is going to pass around and because the interaction with the fluid, like a back T, you're going to disperse the chemical. That's going to be how the dispersion because the velocity of the fluid around your dispersion section. So it is important always, we recommend always to do the previous analysis, which is the diagnostic, identify the problems, design, which is determining the amount of chemical that you are using, and then the method of installation based on your BHA or the production stream. And then, well, these three steps are basically the steps that you need to cover in order to, like, do an optimal design. Next uh, one, please. If you got any question, uh, Renzo and I are going to be here a couple of minutes. So please go ahead and ask your questions. And you got our emails. Uh, if you want to contact us with any further information, case study, more detailed information, uh, we can go ahead. Luis. Thank you very much. Hey, Luis. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, we had a question. Uh, somebody is asking uh, how the, is the same configuration for the chemical treatment for different uh, Artificial lips. Okay, well, that's a very good question, and I can explain. Uh, I can explain at the at the end of the conclusion. Based on your chemical treatment, you are going to define the method of installation. If you are using an ESP, the chemical treatment could be installed right below the sensor. We recommend always to set up a spacer joint, maybe a. 32.5 joint between the sensor and the chemical so we can uh, install the chemical far from the heating of the motor 
and the dispersion section is going to be uh, at the bottom of the key so that's for ESP for example if you have a uh, sander below the ESP our chemical tool can be below the detail joints so we are treating it well from the bottom we are protecting the desander, we are protecting the slurry sub, and then we are passing through the motor to the rest of the production stream. For rod pump, uh, we are installed below the intake. So there has to be previously installed an intake below the pump. We are running below that intake, and the dispersion is going to act the same way. The velocity around the dispersion section, and we are going to pass through it. The same principle applies for rod pump, PCP, gas lift, jet pump, we have to set up an intake before the pump. So that's how it's going to be the method of installation based on the on the chemical trim. And again, if you have anything below it, for example, if you have a rod pump and then you have a gas separator, we can be installed below the gas separator. If you have a desander, we can go below the desander. If you have any, any other component as an intake, different than just a slurry sub, we can go below that intake. Thank you, Luis. I had some other questions, Luis, and I guess I'm referring to me. Um, okay, so they're asking me what is the DHPS. So, like I mentioned before, the DHPS is an, an, a, a new alternative for iron sulfide dissolving. So, theta keys means that uh, DHPS means actually theta keys hydroxy phosphonium salt. The main reason why how these chemicals work for dissolving iron sulfide is the fact that it's very cationic species. It's very cationic, that means it's going to increase the binding with sulfur. So, it's going to act like a scavenger. You may think it that way. That's why. This question about the, uh, the solubility of the, of the chemicals of the chemical uh, sticks. So the solubility of the chemical sticks are, are designed to be almost 100% water soluble. That means if you have higher production uh, water caps, higher water cap percentage, that means the bleaching uh, process of the chemical is going to be accelerated a little bit. Another important factor that is going to accelerate the leaching uh, of the chemical is going to be higher temperature. But we are working right now in trying to get polymers that can have more thermal stability. And that's part of the process that we're working right now. Because there are some worlds where the temperature line can reach really high. And that is going to decrease the, the runtime of, 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 the, of, the, of the chemicals, of course. Um, I had another question as well. Uh, it says, uh, Okay, can you combine the chemical treatment with the gas and sand? I think we really already answered that question. <clears throat> Our chemical tools are very flexible. We can combine with gas and sand separated as well. And we provide those those uh, 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 those solutions as well for, for the uh, community as well. Well, if there is no further questions, you are free to send an email uh, with more information on we have another one, right? So oh, yes. You, yes. Uh, well, Dan, Angel is asking, let me check. He's asking, uh, what is the longest treatment that you can deliver in terms of longevity months? Okay. Uh, Angel, this is a, a good question. Uh, uh, and it depends. Well, the longest treatment we have run, uh, then we have record has been around 737 days. But then, this is going to depend of the bottom hole condition as well, right? So, what is the temperature? What is the red hole you have available to run the chemical? And then, what's going to be your water cut? The idea is try to combine that information, try to relate that information, simulate the dispersion that we are going to have under that, under under those conditions, and then achieve the longevity expected. The longevity expected is the value determined 
with the operator company. And then, like we did in the pilot project, and we checked, it was determined based on the average runtime of the field, right? There are other operators who are looking for made profitable in the project. And the, and the economic financial maybe evaluation of the project, they determine that the project is going to be profitable if we actually are achieving a runtime without no stop that longer than maybe a year, year and a half, two years. So that's how the way we design the longevity. And we determine how long we can be down hold. We can run the simulation based on the condition, and we can tell the customer, hey, it will be nine months, it will be 12, 15, 18 months, but it's based on each, on each case evaluation. Uh, we got another question. Have you seen a better efficiency with downhole chemical or, surf or surface chemical? Uh, if you think about it, when you are sick, for example, let, let's say that you have a headache, you know? And then uh, normally when you get a headache, you take a pill, a pill, anything, right? The pill is going to flow downward your system and it's going to disperse in your stomach. And there you're going to release the half the component of the chemical in your body. The same thing happened with the downhole treatment. You're having a problem normally downhole, which is affecting your pump, your tubing, your downhole equipment. Uh, the right thing will be take those chemicals and put it downhole, where actually is uh, where actually the problem is taking place. Uh, surface chemical is pretty effective as well. The problem is when you have a high fluid column and then your chemical is not able to reach the bottom of the well on time, maybe, or it's just because the foam. There are some cases where uh, the foam is a big problem and then or the high pressure gas, and it is like retaining your chemical in the fluid column, avoiding to go down. So the best thing you can do is, from the beginning, set up your chemical treatment where you actually need it. And then from the beginning of the production, start the dispersion and start with the protection of your BHA. That's uh, the way how we can see uh, good results. And then um, you are not waiting for uh, that is, I mean, for the surface chemical to displace from the top to bottom. You are just treating you well effectively from the bottom. Okay, okay. Well, I think that's everything for now. So, if you got any questions, uh, I mean, any further question, there is our emails, uh, our information, and we are more than pleased to answer or to send you any additional information that you may request. Thank you very much, guys. We will wait for you on Thursday. We are having another webinar based, uh, which is going to be for this standard how to optimize the design or technology. So we'll be waiting for you. Thank you very much. And hope you guys are safe at home and have a good day. Bye. Take care.